Today, as we come to the table, he tried to deceive him, saying, bow down to me, I'll give you the worlds. He only told part of the story, that is. And the Lord knew he'd get the world one day, but not through the deception of Satan. So Satan's not going to try to lie to God to convince him of something, because God knows better. Well, if he's going to heaven and not lying about us, what is he saying to God in heaven about Mark? What's he saying? He's telling the truth. Now, is that humbling or what? He's going to heaven and saying, you saw Mark this week. I saw him. You saw what he was thinking about. I saw it. You saw what he did. I saw it. But he's under the blood. He's under the blood. And see, that's the good news. Satan's a big tattletale. But the good news is God already knows it. Lies can have devastating repercussions on a person's life. Lies have the power to destroy reputations, careers, families. There really is no end to the damage a lie can do. Isn't it comforting to know that in the court of heaven, where the accuser comes to bring a case against us, the true judge sees through every lie? Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. When it comes to the truth, the mistakes we've made and sins we've committed, the judge's response is a simple, profound truth that those sins are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Because of this, we get to live a truly free life. Guilt and shame can fall right off of us as we move forward with Christ. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Revelation chapter 12 as he continues his message, The Woman, the Child, and the Dragon. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Revelation chapter 12. As we continue on through the book of Revelation, John continues on in his vision. And notice what it says in verse 7, and war broke out in heaven. And let me say this, before we get into that as much, here's where we are in this whole process. There's that final seven years that God has promised to deal with the nation of Israel. We see it back in Daniel chapter 9. Now we're seeing it again in Revelation. And he says, I've got seven more years of prophecy that I've promised the nation of Israel the scripture indicates the rapture will take place. We will be taken out of here, and then there'll be seven more years on the earth of God dealing with the earth. We're right now at the middle of that. The setting is this, and we'll see this in other places as we work through the scripture. A little bit about this, because it talks about the Antichrist, and we'll see what's going on with him during this process. But where we take up here in verse 7 is about mid, what they call the mid-tribulation. And that is your three and a half years in, it would appear, and this is where the Antichrist is going to stand up and declare that he's God. And believe it or not, the world's going to believe that he's God. Now, why would the world believe he's God? The Bible also tells us prophetically that the Antichrist is either going to literally die, maybe it's a, a, an assassination attempt, maybe it's a, he's in an accident, we don't know, but it says he's literally going to either appear to die or to die and then from this appearance, he's going to be resurrected or appear to resurrect from the dead or literally resurrect from the dead if indeed he dies. You say, well, Mark, how can he resurrect from the dead? Satan does not have power to resurrect from the dead. But if the Antichrist dies and Satan or some demon possesses him, all he has to do is stand up. And if God allows that, the world's going to freak out. Because you see, in world history, there's only been one person who ever died and resurrected himself there have been others that have died and resurrected. Jesus resurrected multiple people from the dead. But this was one person has died, said he would resurrect himself, and then resurrected himself three days later. That's Jesus Christ. The Antichrist will appear to do the same thing. His body will appear to be dead and revive and or literally be dead, and the Antichrist be entered by a demon spirit or Satan himself and rise up. So if the world sees this man, by the way, remember, anti means instead of. So if the world sees this man instead of Jesus, he's not the only one that has done it. In other words, I have risen too. He's going to stand up in that third temple that will be rebuilt and declare that he's God. If he does that and the world sees him resurrect, you can see why the world would follow him. And the Bible says after this happens, he's also going to demonstrate supernatural powers such as calling down fire from heaven and all these other things that are going to take place. So that's the setting here. Now, what's interesting is 
as we now shift to the setting of the Antichrist declaring he's God on the earth at this three and a half year point and the world believing him for the most part and the war now beginning against God and against Jesus Christ for him to try to rule the world rather than this child we saw called up to heaven in John's vision with a rod of iron. No, the Antichrist says, no, I'm going to rule. Satan says, I'm going to rule. I will ascend to the farthest sides of the north. When he tries this earthly takeover, the scene is also going to be a heavenly takeover attempt as well. You're going to see a two-front assault by Satan. He'll be deceiving the world and trying to control it, which he'll be able to to a degree for those three and a half years. But you're also going to see a war in heaven at the same time as he, in his arrogance, tries to overthrow God, even as he's overthrowing man. Obviously, it's going to fail, and that's where we take up in verse 7. War broke out in heaven. So you got the earthly battle and the heavenly battle here at the same time. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, that is Satan, and the dragon and his angels fought. Notice the demonic realm is called his angels. They fought, but they did not prevail. There's the key. They did not prevail, nor was place found for them in heaven any longer. Number one, first of all, they did not prevail. Why? Because God is greater. Satan will never prevail against God. And remember, when Satan fell, he took a third of the angels with him, but how many of the, how many of the angels are with God and us? Two-thirds. And by the way, God can always create more if he wanted. You know, it's not a matter of, oh, no, what if you get someone? No, God can create as many angels as he wants. God doesn't even need an angel to defend him. He's God Almighty. And so it's not going to be a battle. And notice this. It's not a battle between Satan and God. I want to note that. They're not equals. God and Satan are not equals. The world seems to think that they're equals. There's this big battle between God and Satan. No, there's not. God is the only one. He's ultimately in control of all things. He simply uses Satan to carry out things that he's going to do and the direction that the world's going to go. Satan is a servant, if you will, of God. You ever wonder why Satan's not already locked up? Why didn't God just lock him up? I can guarantee you when God is through with Satan, he will be locked up eternally and he'll never get out. But right now, God allows him to roam free because he's used by God to carry out the Lord's will. So he's actually a servant of the Lord. Don't get me wrong. Not that God likes evil. God's not promoting evil. God is not saying, here's my great servant, Satan. What he's saying is, I'm going to allow these things to happen to separate the sheep from the goats. I'm going to let Satan be involved in that process. Although he's evil, I will use it for my good and separate my people and judge those in rebellion to heaven on earth. So again, that's why Satan is still running around, but they're not going to prevail. So the battle is not between Satan and God. The battle is between Michael and Satan. And the heavenly angels against the fallen angels. That's an equal battle. God and Satan are not an equal battle. But even between these that we would say is an equal battle, obviously Satan and his angels are outnumbered uh, two to one. And so they do not prevail. And notice this statement here, don't let this stumble you, nor was place found for them in heaven any longer. What do you mean any longer? I thought Satan and the demonic realm were thrown out back in the garden of Eden. They were. They were cast out. But here's what the Bible says. Although they can no longer live in heaven, they still can travel back and forth and visit. And where do we see this? All through the scripture. I'll give you one example. Job. It says that Satan and the fallen angels came and stood before God and said, let us at Job. We want to get at him. And he said, all right, you can do this, but you can't do anymore. You know the story. He allowed him to go down and mess with Job. It didn't work. They go back before God, if you read those first couple of chapters of Job, and they say, well, now let me try this, right? And they try that. You know the whole story of Job. We see other places where the angels, again, in the demonic realm, goes before the Lord. As a matter of fact, we're going to see in a moment where it says that he's the accuser of the brethren, which means he's going on a regular basis up before God to heaven and accusing us. So the fact that he's not there any longer, so what happened and, and what happens with him not being able to go any longer? It is at this point where he will be cast out and the demons cast out where they can never enter heaven even to accuse us anymore. Done. Heaven will be closed forever to Satan and the demonic realm in that final three and a half years during the great tribulation. And this is what we're reading about here in verse eight. Verse nine, so the great dragon was cast out that servant of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the entire world. He was cast to the earth and his angels, the demonic realm that is, were cast out with him. Again, notice all the names here. The dragon showing that he's got this evil heart, the servant of old, the deceptive heart, the devil and Satan, he's a deceiver and he deceives the entire world. And again, is not the entire world being deceived by the enemy today. The Bible says the entire world is under the sway of the wicked one except for you. 
You're not under a sway. If you choose to believe it or go that way, you're choosing to go that way. The world has no choice. They believe it. They believe the lies that we're being told. And again, nothing specific I'm talking about now, just in general. Satan controls the world and leads them the way that he wants them to go. So the one that's deceiving the whole world is going to be cast out finally and his holy angels with him. And by the way, he'll be deceiving the world here at the very end in relation to the mark of the beast and the Antichrist as well. And so that's what he's talking about. Notice he says, verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night. He's like, give it a rest. <laughs> day and night he's accusing us, has been cast down. Now let's talk about this accuser of the brethren for a moment. Guys, note this. In my mind, I used to think about Satan going up there and, and, and accusing me, saying false things to God about me, you know, just lying or whatever. But think about it. Satan can't lie to God. God knows everything. I don't think Satan would even try to lie to God because God would know right then, you're a liar. You're deceiving. Now, we know that Satan tried to lie to Jesus in the wilderness when he said you know, certain things or whatever, but he didn't lie to the point where he knew the Lord would correct him because, again, he tried to deceive him, saying, bow down to me, I'll give you the worlds. He only told part of the story, that is. And the Lord knew he'd get the world one day, but not through the deception of Satan. So Satan's not going to try to lie to God to convince him of something because God knows better. Well, if he's going to heaven and not lying about us, what is he saying to God in heaven about Mark? What's he saying? He's telling the truth. Now, is that humbling or What? He's going to heaven and saying, you saw Mark this week. I saw him. You saw what he was thinking about. I saw it. You saw what he did. I saw it. But he's under the blood. He's under the blood. And see, that's the good news. Satan's a big tattletale. But the good news is God already knows it. And Satan's not saying anything to God that he doesn't know that I've already done this week or whatever day and night when he's up there accusing us. And part of, I think, the strength of Satan is, is a lot of the things he accuses us of are true. And so it makes us feel weak. It makes us feel defeated. You know, you're right. I am that way. I did do that. And so we get condemned, but God hasn't condemned us. We are forgiven by his blood. Again, whenever you're feeling heavy, here's the way to tell them if it's the enemy or God. If it's conviction, then you'll know it's like, I need to get this right. This isn't right. I need to do something. That's conviction. If it's condemnation, that's the enemy. How do we know? You're not condemned. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans chapter 8. So that's how you tell the difference in the attack of the enemy and conviction of the Holy Spirit. Well, Satan is going to be again doing his best to try to bring us down and to accuse the brethren day and night before the Lord. But notice this, right after he says he's up there accusing us, he gives us now the answer to defeat those accusations and to walk in freedom in verse 11. It says, and they overcame him, notice by three things. Number one, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Notice these three things. First of all, by the blood of the lamb. Now, I've heard people pray this prayer, and I'm not going to condemn you for praying this prayer. You know, Lord, I pray the blood of Jesus over so-and-so. I'm not going to, you know, down you for that. But that's not what this is saying. What this is saying is you're not going to get victory by praying the blood over something. Here's where the victory comes, understanding that you have the blood now over you. It's an understanding. He's been defeated. You've gone to the cross. You've received that blood. You've received that sacrifice in your own heart. And because of that, you now have overcome. It's not because of your strength or your might or your great planning. It's simply a prayer you prayed from the heart to receive Jesus and to confess your sins. Then you've overcome the evil one. If you have the blood of the lamb washing you, you're going into heaven. Now, that doesn't mean you'll be perfect. That doesn't mean the enemy can't accuse you. It doesn't mean any of that. What it means is you're going to heaven. The blood of the lamb is now yours because you've confessed your sin and turned to God. That's the first way that we find victory. Salvation, running to the cross through Jesus. That's obvious. What is the second one? They also, or rather, that's the first way the enemy's defeated. What's the next way he's defeated? The word of their testimony. Your testimony's powerful. It's a rebuke to the enemy. And might I add, it's a rebuke to the world. I had people tell me, you can't just stop doing what you were doing, Mark. You can't just stop that. Oh, really? You can't. Well, God did it. So figure it out. That's between you and God. Well, I've never, well, you go ask him. He'll do the same thing for you. And by the way, the enemy sees his defeat in that because it shows that although we've been enslaved to these things, now we're set free by Jesus Christ. And those that knew you before and those now that know you afterwards, they see that power of God in your life. It's the defeat of the enemy vocally and you're a walking witness. But here's another way you can use this. 
Sometimes people say, well, Pastor Mark, how do I share my faith? I don't know what to do. And there are some great techniques out there. You can buy some books and watch some videos and all of them are great. Most of them are great. I don't know of all of them, but the point is they can give you some great ideas and techniques and here's how to share your faith and all that. And I've seen those, they're wonderful. But this is also a great way to share your faith if you're one of those that doesn't necessarily want to say to the person, you're a sinner, you need to repent, okay? Now, at some point, they need to understand they're a sinner, they need to repent, but that doesn't always come across the best with certain people, especially right off the bat. You don't want to walk up and say, hey, you're a sinner, you need to repent, let's talk, you know? Now, for some people, they're ready to hear that and they'll like respond to that, but that's few. But here's what a testimony does. They're talking to you about their life and how hard things are, whatever, the conversation comes up and it's really awful and it's, you know what? I have to tell you what God did for me. And you start sharing your testimony. I was wrapped up in all these things and all these sins, and I was doing this and doing that. My life was a horrible mess. And somebody told me about Jesus, and he died for my sins. I simply confessed my sin. I asked him to forgive me. I asked him to come into my life, and he set me free from those things. He's given me a brand new life, and you know what? You seem hopeless. He'll do the same thing for you. You didn't call him a sinner. You didn't confront them. You didn't make them feel awkward. You shared about you and what God has done in you. Now, they have to walk away and think about that. Because if it's sin for you, what does that mean it is for them? It's sin as well. If you were set free, that means they can be set free. And it starts a process where those seeds begin to grow and people cry out to the Lord. So if you're looking for another avenue to share your faith, your testimony is a fantastic way, a very fantastic non-confrontational way to share your faith. And so I encourage you, use your testimony. So they overcame him by that way, but notice the last one. And this one, they're all three so powerful. This last one, they did not love their lives to the death. The word love here is the word agape. It's a self-sacrificial love, which is how we naturally love ourselves and our lives. By the way, the Bible teaches that we naturally love ourselves greatly. If somebody says you need to love yourself more before you can love others, that's not true. That is not a biblical concept. That is an earthly psychological concept. And I'll tell you what it does. If I waited to think about myself as highly as they tell me I'm supposed to before I can help others, I would never help anybody. And then by the time I got there, I'd be puffed up with so much pride, I wouldn't want to share with anybody. We love ourselves by nature. It doesn't mean people don't get depressed. That doesn't mean suicide is not real. But typically suicide is because we love each other so much, we hate the fact of the misery we're in and that we're having to endure it. So we want to stop the misery we're experiencing because we love ourselves. And so we have a self-sacrificial love. And there's this also this desire to survive when we're under the water. It's what makes us want to get to the top and go, <gasps> right? It's a natural desire for life. We don't want to die. And we also don't want to go through the pain of death, if you will. But here's what he's saying. If we can come to a place to where we conquer that by the power of the Spirit and we're not afraid of death, we can defeat the enemy because the only thing, the worst thing he can throw at us is death. And if we're not afraid to die, we've won. We've won. Listen, if you know that you're never going to really die, you're going to move from this body to your brand new body and the kingdom of God, and God's going to give you the grace when that time comes and whatever way we make that transfer. I trust in God's grace and God's power to do that because he loves us. It's going to be something he's going to make gracious for us when that day comes and you know that day's coming and you're not afraid of that day. You might be looking forward to it. You might be saying, I want to, you know, die today. I'm not saying that. But you may be saying, you know what? I'm not worried about it when that day comes. When that happens, and if that happens, you're free. You're absolutely free. But you're absolutely free. And listen, this is part of the problem right now with this whole virus thing. I'm not denying that it's real. I'm not denying that some people have died. That's not my point. But here's the thing. If you're not afraid to die, then you can't be paralyzed with fear. You realize every one of us, listen, here's a harsh reality. Everybody in here, unless the rapture takes place, and I think it will in our generation, just me talking, nobody knows the day or the hour, but I think we're so close. But unless that happens, every one of us are going to die. We're all going to die in some form, in some fashion, at some point, at some time. And if we can get to where we're not afraid of that, we're free. We're free. Why do you think the world is freaking out so much? Why is everyone panicking in such despair over this whole situation with COVID-19? Again, natural desire to preserve life. I'm not saying we want to die, okay? We're all together on this, right? We want to live, okay? But why is everybody so scared outside of the church? Because 
They fear death. They're paralyzed. You want to see the, the magnitude of fear of what's happening with this whole thing. I mean, I, I understand taking precautions in the right place. But as we talked about last week, where the fear really is manifested to me, I see people in their cars riding around with masks on. Now, I'm not making fun of them. I'm not making fun of them, but where are you going to catch it from? You? If you've already got it, you've got it. And the mask makes it worse because you're breathing you in, right? But why would people do that? Fear. There's so much fear that even when it's only one person alone, they're paralyzed. And they do the only thing, that grab the mask, grab this, do whatever I have to do. Why? Guys, once the fear is taken away, you're a free person. Someone says, I'm going to kill you for whatever the reason, for your faith. And you know what? Say, well, you can't kill me. You can stop my body, but I'm going to continue on. And when you get to that place, see, Paul was there. Paul was unstoppable. Why was Paul unstoppable? He wasn't afraid to die. He said, the worst thing you can do to me is kill this body, but I'm going to live forever. Jesus said, don't fear those who can harm your body. He said, fear those who can cast your soul into hell. That's who you should fear. And so we have to have the right priorities. The only way you can have that kind of confidence is to have a true and vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. But if you do, you'll have that freedom. He says, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. And here's why. He says, okay, you think it's bad now, but woe to those on the earth and the sea. Remember the battle going on up in heaven? He says, woe to you for... The devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that his time is short. In other words, he's got three and a half years until he's locked up. He's going to throw everything he can at the earth and mankind. Think about that. It's bad enough with the assault of the enemy that God allows now. Think about when he has just three and a half years and he has everything left. I kind of picture it like somebody, you know, you're the last guy in your platoon and you're in some foreign land and you've got the vehicle that has all the explosives and you're kind of like riding to the city like Rambo, you know, <laughs> you know, whatever. And they're going to kill you. You know you're going to die anyway. And you're just trying to make it the front gate so blow the whole vehicle up and take as many of them out as you can, right? That's Satan. He knows he's done. He's surrounded by the power of God. He has no more chance. He's lost. He's been thrown out of heaven. His followers have been thrown out. Those on the earth are going to be judged. He's going to throw everything at it and it's going to be an ugly time that last three and a half years. Now you know why he said woe to the earth, but let me add another reason why he said woe to those on the earth during this last three and a half years. That's just Satan's wrath. Now, I don't want to be a part of Satan's wrath, and I'm sure you don't either. But the Bible says this is also when God will pour out his wrath. And there's a big difference in the wrath of Satan and the wrath of God. You see, Christians, we sometimes face the wrath of Satan. We sometimes face the wrath of man. But 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says you will never face the wrath of God. It has not been appointed to us to have the wrath of God. That is why we're going to be gone. That is why his bride has to be removed before that, because God won't do that to us. They're going to have the wrath of God and the wrath of Satan coming down on them at one time. Look what happens here at this point. It says, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth... He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time. And just like that, another time at the table of God's Word has come to an end. Pastor Mark will continue teaching through the book of Revelation next time. But you don't have to wait until then to listen to more great Bible studies. You can access this series plus much more at thewaymedia.net. Feel free to share these messages with anyone who wants to know more about what the Bible has to say. Before we close, we want you to know if you live in the Knoxville area, we invite you to join Pastor Mark and the community of Jesus followers at Calvary Knoxville for our next service. For over 20 years, it's been incredible to see how God has used us in our local community and through His radio outreach. There's always a seat for you, Sunday mornings at 8, 9.30, or 11.15. We also meet on Sunday nights at 6 or Wednesday nights at 7. If you can't make it in person, that's not a problem. You can join us online. We're streaming our services through the Way Media app. You can download this from your app store or right from the waymedia.net. To find out more info on Calvary Knoxville, scroll to the bottom of the waymedia.net for a link to our church website. Pastor Mark has more to share from the book of Revelation, a fascinating and sometimes mind-boggling book that consists of things from the past and touches on what's to come in the future. One sure way to not be anxious about the things written in Revelation is to fully understand exactly what God's telling us prophetically. So be sure to join us the next time we come to the table.
Come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.